All right, we're at 12.15. So um, in order to keep us on track, I, I really do um, want to get going at 12.15. And those who join us along the way, it's going to be great to, uh, to see them. Um, so my name is Jenny Heyman. I'm a program manager with eCampus Ontario. My colleagues Terry Green and Joanne Kehoe are joining us today as well, also colleagues at eCampus Ontario. Um, in addition to working with grant uh, leads, I also am leading for this academic year um, OER, Open Educational Resource Community Building. And as part of that, and as part of the spectrum of things we're doing at eCampus Ontario, we're doing this new Bento Box series, webinar series. Uh, once every couple of weeks for 30 minutes, we're just gonna talk on uh, an education topic that's relevant in Ontario. Um, this week happens to be Science Literacy Week, and so I'm very pleased to welcome our guest, um, Dr. Bill Jew from University of Toronto. And Bill is a neuroscience expert and describes his courses and approach to teaching neuroscience as full contact at full speed. <laughs> Wouldn't I love to be a student in one of your courses, Phil? Uh, his current mission is to help create educational equity in education everywhere, and that is certainly a mission that eCampus Ontario is on. Um, so welcome, Bill, and thank you for joining us today in our first um, Bento Box series webinar. We're very pleased to have you. Um, just to let everyone know, I have the record button on so that we can share and save this uh, webinar. Um, and put it on our website as soon as we can get it transcribed and translated. Um, so welcome, Bill. And uh, is there anything you'd like to say to get us going about um, your take on science literacy? Um, no, thank you for having me. First of all, uh, I think it's um, really cool, the great uh, initiatives that are being done by eCampus Ontario. And I, I certainly um, really appreciate uh, the fact that um, equity is kind of being built into the entire process, which I think is really important. Um, I don't really know what to say about science literacy other than it's a good thing and I think everyone should engage in it. Um, I think that we had sort of discussed a, a number of issues related to um, science literacy sort of off um, the air uh, previously. Um, and I, I think for me personally, like the, the whole issue of getting students to start learning to read different types of um, uh, research, particularly um, as it's an important part of science, is um, really important. And then also the communication aspect, trying to get students to learn how to communicate in the 21st century related to um, science and communicating it to a broad array, uh, array of um, individuals who are interested in it now is a real challenge for us as educators. Mm -hmm. So I'm, one of my questions, Bill, is, is how do you keep on top of, uh, of your own learning? So you share, you know, I have seen in the spaces where you share your work that you share very generously with students, your time and your energy. Um, how do you keep in the science literacy aspect on top of your discipline? What do you read? Um, what kinds of things do you look at? Um, I think that kind of um, falls into two different categories. One, I'm always interested in how my field in neuroscience is changing. And I think that as educators, we should be trying to encourage students as much as possible to be current and recent, um, not just teaching the classic um, neuroscience that I was taught many, 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 many years ago, but also to um, teach them about the exciting new frontiers. And um, I generally try my best to set aside about um, a day every week to kind of read papers. I encourage my own students to do exactly the same thing. Um, I also try to share as much as possible on social media why I think that some papers, um, some research might be of particular interest um, to them in the field. The, the other aspect that you sort of brought up is related. And um, how do you stay current in terms of pedagogy? So we teach most of the time, it becomes really hard to get out to different um, pedagogy meetings and to stay current on different practices. Um, but the one thing that I found really good, the, the best critics, which are the students, are also the, the um, best sources to hear about these um, different forms of engagement that are going on on campus. I don't have to be in every classroom. My students are mm -hmm. having um, regular meetings with them and hearing about what interests them, what excites them is um, one of those ways in which I try to stay current in terms of the pedagogy and how I might um, improve the way I, I teach or engage my students. Do you, do your students share resources with you? Like, do they surprise you? And what, like, you're like, wow, that really is a good article. And I didn't, I hadn't seen it. Does that happen? Yeah, I, I think that happens all the time that students are always finding um, 
different articles and they are really happy to share uh, whatever interests them um, to see if that also interests me. And in most cases, uh, the, I, I'm just thrilled to be able to see a paper that um, a student has found interesting. So yeah, they share all the time. Great, yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, that's been my experience of teaching as well. Um, so I did have a few questions. I wanna make sure that I don't uh, miss some, some of the fun stuff. Um, um, so student mental health, um, I see by in your social media spectrum and the things that you're doing, you're talking quite a bit about student mental health. Mental health. I assume you're talking with your students about that. Um, what kinds of things are happening in that spectrum of literacy that you're seeing this year? I think the one thing that um, I think is really important that seems to be neuroscience related and also teaching related, um, and we're actually Learn, uh, looking at this ourselves in our own classrooms, um, these ideas that movement breaks are really important for students and their mental health, being able to focus, um, feeling connected to each other in the classroom. And I think there's always a sense of unease. Um, I actually have to go up there in front of students and lead these exercise breaks. I'm not in the best shape and I'm not um, someone who's normally very active during class. So, um, getting that whole aspect and talking to students about movement breaks, why they're necessary, why they might be beneficial for mental health, um, feeling engaged in the classroom, I think is one of those things that we're seeing really rapidly appearing on campus. A number of classes have taken this up and it's really important. Um, again, we had sp uh, spoken off air as well about um, how do we actually uh, empower our students related to all of these different issues of mental health. I think that we're at the point now where through all of these different types of campaigns, excellent campaigns, by the way, um, where students are more aware of mental health issues, that it's okay to talk about mental health. Um, last week in Australia, for example, there was the whole Are You Okay campaign. And of course, we had the Bell Let's Talk campaign. Um, I think another aspect of uh, literacy in general um, is <clears throat> once we get students to t start talking, empowering them to uh, look at different resources and then trying to figure out which resources are actually good resources versus separating those out that um, may not really be all that beneficial uh, to students and empowering them in that way, being able to respond, find these resources, but also deciding for themselves um, like what resources might be good or not so good resources. Mm -hmm. Great. And what kind of spaces do students share those resources in? Do you have a space in your course shell where your particular students are sharing ideas about anything at all, you know, resources related to your course, resources related to other things, or are they using social media spaces more? Um, I think those lines have actually become blurred. So we do a lot of things that are um, both in social media, but also mirrored on our course shells like in the different discussion boards. And students are generally, um, Again, they fall into different categories, and I think some students are actually very interested in sharing. Some students want to hear about um, these resources that are available, and they're um, just listening in on these conversations. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that generally speaking, that having different places where students feel that they can share is really important, whether it's on social media uh, or whether it's directly in um, a course. And I think having it in either of those spaces or both is actually really useful for um, any educator out there. Mm -hmm. um, we talked a little bit earlier, um, so Bill and I had an offline conversation to get to know each other a little bit better and talk about a few things related to our eCampus Ontario work. And one of the things that we talked about was the use of open educational resources, the spectrum of open textbooks, um, which we hope, um, I think all of us will agree, that, that that is a student empowerment. So what kinds of things are you doing in your work um, and with your students and with U of T? about on the spectrum of open textbooks and OER. Sorry, I just have a colleague who's running in the back there. That's okay, you know, it's an open office. That's, you yeah, know. no worries. <laughs> it's an open office, awesome, nice. These um, open educational um, puns are going to be something I'm gonna uh, write down and um, actually share with others because we have to share these open resources, right? Um, so actually, I, I have a daughter who's just started uh, university this year and um, as, as a parent and also as an educator, um, it's really interesting to see um, all of these hidden costs. Like I had known that it was going to be an expensive uh, endeavor for her to come and study here at U of T. Um, 
but all of these different textbooks that she has to um, purchase and um, the updated versions of these textbooks has actually been really eye-opening for me. So even prior to that, um, we've sort of been moving toward um, thinking about the costs that are accrued to students um, at coming into post-secondary education because it's, it's much more expensive and the students are very different than they used to be a few years ago. Many of them are working to support mm -hmm. themselves. It's different than when I was a, a student and having these extra costs has um, actually really bothered me quite a lot in the, in the past few years. So one aspect of um, the, this whole um, eCampus Ontario project that I'm involved with is to um, adapt as well as to um, help to write sort of the next generation of textbooks that are going to be um, open educational resources. And also um, encouraging my colleagues to be open education rangers, like learning more about the whole open education uh, movement has actually been uh, really interesting as well. Not everyone is aware of what open educational resources are. Yes, yeah, and, and awareness is, is, is one of our big campaigns that we're focusing on this year at eCampus Ontario. You, can, you, know, you can't do a thing if you're not aware of it. And what I find really interesting, and probably if you talk with you know, many of your colleagues, is that they often do this. They are often open educators. They don't call it that. They don't define open educational resources exactly the same way that UNESCO defines them, but um, many, many educators care very deeply about the costs for students and are very aware of of you know what resources cost students and how those can add up um, for all students whether they're working or not and it's um, it's better and worse in some disciplines than others um, for sure so everything that we can do to create awareness and especially to create awareness and, and I will shamelessly promote our open textbook library to, to create awareness that there is now um, a repository a place where educators can go and have a look and there's you know there's no harm in doing that check through the textbooks, check the quality of the textbooks that are in there. If the biology, OpenStax biology textbook or the first Canadian edition um, is aligned with the textbook you're already using, um, you know, that's a paradigm that you, can, that you can consider as part of your spectrum. Um, although um, one of the things that I find really interesting is, is getting away from just text and talking about other, you know, other things like graphic design and interactive design and VR, which is very, it's a very hot topic. It's a very fun topic around eCampus Ontario, especially we have something called the Student Experience Design Lab. Uh, and the students are extremely excited about VR in a lot of ways. So what kinds of things have you seen or done or are checking out in that spectrum? Yeah, I think, um, I think there's actually a lot to your question. Um, I'm going to try to answer it the best I can uh, in pieces. Mm -hmm. um, one, I think the way that students are um, digesting um, material, especially written material, is really different. One, one aspect that I find really useful um, about these open um, textbooks is that they're much more student um, focused and they're much more easily digestible by students rather than having like a block of text. Mm -hmm. And that goes into um, the whole graphic design, like why, why do they digest material differently? How should we be approaching this? Um, and I've been generally trying to move toward what we call an IKEA design. Um, so you intuitively know you don't need a lot of text. The IKEA is able through um, really short graphics to explain how you put together this really complex piece of furniture. And I think we as educators have to think about how we communicate. Since this is Science uh, Literacy Week, why not think about pedagogy literacy and thinking a little bit about how we might try to get students um, to uh, understand what we are hoping for them, both in textbooks as well as in um, a variety of other settings um, on co course assignments uh, through um, different graphic design. And, and yes, it's a very different way to think, but I think we need to, as educators, um, be open-minded. And again, another one of those open education puns. Um, and I think we need to be really open about um, trying to develop new ways to communicate with our students um, and not just complain that students don't read their textbooks. There's a reason why they're not reading their textbooks because they're no fun to read. Um, and I, I think we need to make them uh, much more accessible. Mm -hmm. and going back to your via her, by the way, uh, I think that the, the things that we always think about and we always have these little wish lists of things in, in VR and augmented reality and mixed reality, we, we see all these amazing things and we want to um, really try to engage students um, in um, our courses in a variety of different platforms. And I think 
ultimately, as you mentioned, those are different platforms that we need to be looking at as well. Right. In addition to Pressbooks. So one of the things we talked about was Pressbooks is a focus on text at the moment, um, yes. but will probably be evolving as we all do as we go along for sure. Yeah, um, I, I really like Pressbooks. I think, uh, again, I'm, I'm used to the WordPress form, uh, format. So it looks mm -hmm. a lot like WordPress. There isn't a huge learning curve. Um, you still have to sit there typing, thinking about the students as you're um, uh, writing for them. But I think the one aspect that we had sort of touched on briefly um, earlier on was um, there's still a little element of um, this interactivity with students. It's it's still um, pretty much a uh, dead text, if you will. Uh, mm -hmm. It's something that's static. We can um, encourage different forms of active learning as sort of guides or um, different suggestions. But the lack of interactivity, I think, is going to um, lead to sort of the next generation or next iteration of um, press books that makes it easier for us to actively engage um, our students um, in this learning environment that might be uh, textbook um, centered, uh, but will look a little bit different than it does currently. Mm -hmm. And so, um I believe I saw go by somewhere in the social media world, uh, Bill, uh, you did a visual syllabus. Is that correct? Yeah, I like graphic syllabi. Um, okay. I, again, I wanted to be reflective of um, how I want my students to be creative. So I have to model that for them and um, modeling how it conveys all the same information in a very different way for students uh, is really important for me as well. And again, it's part of the, the types of things that we like to share with everyone. We want everyone, not just um, the group here, to be thinking about how to communicate with students in more effective ways. Great. Yeah, we'd love to see that. I'm, if you can share a link with that, if you have time, um, we can include it with our webinar. Um, I think many educators in Ontario would love to, love to see what that looks like. Absolutely. Um, and I know in the, in the States, we have a great um, colleague, Robin DeRosa, who's a, a colleague of Rajiv Jangani, too. Rajiv is from BC, and he talks with Robin from the States a lot about open education, but they do talk about this um, graphic approach uh, in syllabi for sure. And one of the things that Robin talks about is getting her students involved in actually building textbooks. Is that something that, that you've considered or thought through? Or? You know, I'm really lucky in the sense that we have these great individuals that work with us here at U of T. So not just people in the um, office that I work in, but also uh, centrally. And that was the very first question when we had learned that um, we were going to be included as part of this e-textbook um, project and uh, we were going to be using Pressbooks. Uh, the first question that both my, myself and my colleague who also got into this project, we looked at each other and goes, could students use this and could we get students to write a textbook and could they um, update a textbook or could they uh, somehow get access to this? And um, I think it's one of those things that's definitely on everyone's radar. Like how can we get students as creators, as co-creators in this whole process? Great, awesome. And, and so you're a neuroscientist. <laughs> what do you think, what kinds of things does that do for their, for their learning and their retention and for their, you know, for their learning brains if, if they're more involved that way? Well, I, I think the, the one thing that everyone knows, um, you don't have to be a neurobiologist, um, is that if you, if you can get a student engaged in the material, they're always going to remember it, retain that information longer. Uh, they're going to um, be looking at sort of the next iteration. The, the higher creative, um, critical thinking skills that we want can't really do that unless you have a way to engage your students. And I think that um, getting students actively involved in their own learning has been shown time and time again to really enhance um, their engagement, enhance their learning. And I just think it's a natural outcome um, of this. And if we can do that, and if we can get their synapses to be actively engaged, and we can get them to be thinking about um, sort of their future selves, which is more of a uh, psychological construct, but still we borrow it in neuroscience, um, that those are really important um, concepts. Why are we doing all of these things? We want them to also learn these skills that we think are going to be important in their um, work um, study integration, like the things that they're learning in terms of building things in Pressbook, or in WordPress that they can carry with them after they're finished their time here um, as part of their e-portfolios become really useful for them uh, when they're looking for their next um, opportunity after they've graduated. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we're just checking in and I, this was one of my questions. What kind of social media are you on Twitter? Are you, do you do Instagram? What kinds of things do you do um, to, yeah, my, to my share your work, right? So one of the things we can talk about in the spectrum of, of educators is how are you, what does your social identity look like um, in the world? Yeah. Wow, uh, social identity, that's a big one. Um, I think generally I try to be on Facebook because that's where most of my students were. Um, I've moved recently or fairly recently in, into Instagram just to um, share different aspects of life on campus. Um, and this is more related to mental health, not related to um, content or sharing uh, mm -hmm. resource students, which is what I use Facebook for. Right. Uh, I, do, do, I do occasionally use Twitter. Um, mainly I'm on Twitter because I, I also like to stream um, some of my uh, lectures directly on Periscope. Um, not, not every student is going to be able to come to class and we have some classes that are starting fairly late in the evening and for commuters that becomes an issue. So um, having an outlet to stream uh, lectures has been um, important and Periscope works fairly well and people are on Twitter already, so. Mm -hmm. And what's your Twitter handle? Uh, it's Neuroscience UT. All, okay. All, yeah. Great, super. Um, all right, let me see what else I've got in terms of uh, my question list. Um, actually, one of the things that I promised our audience is that we would take a few questions from them for you. Um, so I'm just going to check in with my colleagues and see what we've got going on in the chat window. Or, you know, anyone can speak at any time in Zoom, which is great. So just unmute yourself if you've got a question for Bill and you want to ask. Or maybe I can, so if it's going to be anything like my classes, maybe I will ask all of you, uh, what, what is the most exciting thing that you're currently working on in whatever learning environment you're finding yourselves in? Because I'm always, again, curious to know what else um, people are finding exciting as well. All right, does anyone want to take a shot at that? Yeah, I think we should put Terry on the spot because he just started a couple days ago. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm teasing. I Oh, he's going. Wait yeah. Yeah. Hi, Bill. I'm Terry. Hi, Terry. Nice to meet you. I'm now a fan of yours. <laughs> um, I'm most excited about this project called the Open Faculty Patchbook, that, um, where we're sharing um, stories of pedagogy. I'd love it if you wrote one, actually. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ha hassle you about that. But it's basically just people sharing, faculty sharing stories and how they teach and we want to make a student version as well students sharing stories about how they learn despite how the faculty teach at them huh. yeah i think i think that's a really cool project we're, we're trying to build something similar here called learning hacks because students often build up these hacks that um, they keep to themselves and i think that again we want to be open as possible and have students sharing so i love that idea so i'm looking forward to seeing that down the road cool learning hacks i'm going to check it out Thank you. Well, thank you. Does anyone else want to share something they're working on that they're excited about? I think Joanne should share something. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Um, yes, sure. Hi, Bill. Thanks so much. This has been really fascinating. And a lot of your, like, I really enjoy that you're used, that you're, you devote a lot of your time to building online communities. And that's kind of what I, what my area of interest is, is building a vibrant I, I do, online community. I do actually teach, by the way. My students often wonder, like, um, since you're on there so much, do you actually teach? Uh, I do. <laughs> yes, I'm sure you do very well. But I'm just wondering, like, that, that's where my interest is. And I'm working, like, I work on teaching digital literacy for students. And I also have, um, uh, working on an instructional design interest group where we're trying to kind of talk about how to, because a lot of times the online spaces, it's really difficult. I mean, it's difficult to build a vibrant community in a face-to-face -face experience. So in an online one, it can be even more challenging. And I'm just wondering, you know, as from your educator perspective, like you were fairly new to online teaching, correct? Like you were- uh, I've taught online courses. Yeah. Uh, how did you find that as far as um, getting into that mode or how was that shift for you and what would you kind of what advice would you give to educators who are perhaps new um so i think the one thing is you shouldn't try to um treat it like just teaching a class you actually have to think a little bit about the online learning experience it's not like you're going to stand in front of a webcam 
and do exactly the same thing. So you actually have to design it for um, an audience that it, you have to keep engaged as much as you can. And um, that was actually a real challenge. The, the one thing that I found almost universally that most um, educators have found uh, daunting about the process, um, we like seeing the immediacy of feedback. Online, it's really hard because there's this filter that um, exists uh, through these online learning portals, even if they're done um, in real time. Um, I am, I am going to say though that we can actually use online learning sort of as um, a mixed tool. And I actually like the online space for uh, a regular classroom in a couple of different ways. So even before my classes meet officially, we have um, a number of chat rooms that we allow uh, students to partake in ahead of time. Um, and they get to share information, whatever they feel comfortable about, what other courses they're taking, what kind of research experiences they've had, um, what are their biggest um, uh, successes that they've had in terms of um, different courses. And in some ways, having that online community before the course actually begins has, has really um, allowed a better sense of community in my regular classes. Um, and what we're trying to do is develop the same sort of um, uh, social presence for students in this online environment um, and to have them feel like they're unique even though it's really hard like students feel that at a university it they feel like a number anyways it's even worse when you're online like my prof doesn't know what I um, I'm feeling right now or there could be lots of other barriers so we're, we're trying to figure out if there's a way to do that if you can figure that out um, there's I don't think they have an educational Nobel Prize yet. Maybe they'll build one for you if you can figure that part out. Yeah, uh, well, same. <laughs> we'll keep in touch, okay? That's for sure. <laughs> but I really like that. I just wanted to say kudos to you for, you know, opening up those conversations about, you know, the kind of support that students need and, and they need different kinds of support, what kind, depending on what format of course you're teaching. Yeah, for um, sure. Yeah. So Bill, it's Jenny again. You're you're currently teaching face face to face. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I, I teach face to face, but I think those lines again are kind of blurred. Even though my classes on paper are all face to face, um, all of them are being streamed and recorded. Um, they're they're just not indicated as such, and um, I find that you need that kind of flexibility. And if if we have one sort of catchword for um, what we should be doing for our students. I think it has to be flexibility. We have different learners. That's already come up in this short conversation several times. And I think that if you recognize that we have um, different types of learners, we, we intrinsically have to have flexibility. It's built into everything, like your um, open um, online textbook project, for example, has a number of different formats for students to use. They can even decide to print a hard copy. So we intrinsically know that um, different people like to have different options for them, but we don't do a really good job in the classroom of, of that. And I think that we need to start looking at for mental health reasons, for learning reasons, pedagogical reasons, for research related questions, we need to really think about how do we inherently build in flexibility so that we can test to see if um, this is useful for our students. Does it enhance their learning? So little things like changing the grading scheme, um, allowing uh, for flexibility for learners who might actually require um, a stream, uh, a live stream and or a recorded stream of uh, your lectures. Um, I don't think people should be casually dismissing them. I think they should be looking at um, how can I add more flexibility to my classrooms for my students, not for me, but for them. Mm -hmm. And how many students are you teaching this semester? Um, I think my largest, my largest class is 300 students. Um, I have a smaller class of 100 students, and then I have a small fourth year class of 50 students, so about 450 in total. Wow, that's quite, <laughs> that's quite a lot. But, but you know, I, I do put it out there as a challenge to uh, my colleagues as well. Like 450, um, as a neurobiologist, I can tell you, you can learn everyone's names, everyone's um, hobbies. Um, mm -hmm. Again, we do this sort of in the first day of class. We sort of ask them, like, what's your biggest concern of um, coming into this uh, course? Mm -hmm. um, what are things that um, you wish that I would know about you? And uh, you'd be surprised what students are willing to share but again, it may sound like a lot of students, but um, you'll have to check back in with me at the end of the semester. I'm giving myself a little bit of time, but I guarantee you I'll know all 450 of those students by, by name. 
Great. That's wonderful. I, you know, that's a really wonderful approach to education for sure. Um, well, we only have about a minute left. So um, is there anything that you would want to share with other Ontario educators about science literacy or about openness or about your work that you think would be valuable? Um, I think it'd be really uh, great for everyone to kind of take the um, approach of being open about sharing resources, about not trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, you've, and again, I happen to work at U of T, which is a fairly large campus, and you'd be surprised um, how isolated people feel. And um, I'm hoping that with all of the different initiatives, and I think Terry had mentioned uh, this about um, sharing of um, faculty successes and student successes, mm -hmm. I think we need to be able to do that uh, more effectively and to direct people, as you were saying, to these information portals and, and sharing resources. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing all of those great things. Great, thank you so much, Bill. Uh, I hope that we might see you at our technology enabled in a technology enhanced showcase and seminar tests, November 20th and 21st, one of our great eCampus Ontario events this year. Um, thank you so much for sharing so generously of your time uh, and your educator perspective. Thank you for having me. Great, have a great day. Bye. Thanks everyone.